Hello, Professor Recanello. Welcome to this episode of Today on Wall Street. Uh, Professor Recanello, we're so great to have you here. Before we get started, can you first introduce yourself a little bit to our audience? Okay, so I'm gr I'm very grateful to to be here. My name is Vincent Racaniello. I've been a virologist for the past forty years, studying a variety of different viruses, doing research on them. I've written textbooks, I've written uh, blogs, and I do podcasts. So I surround myself with viruses uh, twenty four hours a day. Yeah, that's a great introduction. And in fact, many of our audience are already subscribers to your podcast. And we will also include a link to your website as well as your um, YouTube channel so people who are interested can take a look. But let's jump right in. We've heard so much about this lab leak theory. Um, as you know, Wall Street Journal reported on Sunday that three researchers from China's Wuhan Institute of Virology sought hospital care in November 2019, which is a month before China reported their first case of COVID-19. And that report sort of added weight to calls for a broader investigation into whether COVID-19 virus could have escaped from the lab. So first question for you, does this piece of new information add any credibility to that lab leak theory? Uh, did your posterior belief change at all after you saw the report? No, I continue to feel very strongly that this virus came from nature. There's really zero evidence that it came from a laboratory. The finding of these three individuals getting sick has nothing to do with COVID-19. We know that they did not have COVID. They had another illness that's already been looked at. Uh, unfortunately, the Wall Street Journal decided not to look any further than the, the, the surface of this report. Uh, and so it means nothing really in, in the larger story, and it doesn't change anything for me. You know, thank you for that clarification. So, you know, more generally, if a scientist wants to establish the lab leak theory, what definitive evidence do we need to see? Oh, if you wanted to <laughs> prove in some way that this virus has originated in a lab, you would uh, ideally go to the lab and look at the lab records and see that they were working on this virus. Uh, presumably the first infections would be um, uh, in laboratory people and you could check them for antibodies in their blood against the virus to confirm the infection. Uh, and we see none of that. We don't see any record. The lab was not working on any virus that is that close to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, no one in the laboratory became ill during that time. Uh, and those are really the two main ways that you would find uh, that, that it came from a lab. So as I say, there's really zero evidence for, the, for, for support of that theory. I see. So, you know, a small pushback on that mm -hmm. could be sort of the transparency issue of some of the Chinese labs. Um, we know that Chinese government was not up front at the very beginning of this pandemic. So how sure are we that the lab or people from the lab are actually telling the truth that they are not studying this this virus? Well, I, I these are my fellow scientists. Um, I, I know them. I know their work. And if they say they were not working uh, on the virus, uh, I believe it. Now, the way scientists work, of course, is when you discover a new virus, you publish it. And there was no record ever of them publishing anything uh, related to SARS-CoV-2, at least not close enough uh, to be the progenitor. Uh, they've been asked multiple times. Zhang Li Shi has been asked multiple times in the media about whether they worked on a, a very closely related viruses. She said, no, I believe it. And most recently, I spoke with three members of the WHO team that was, is investigating the outbreak. And they went to visit the Wuhan Institute of Virology. They asked lab members if they were working on anything similar to this. They all said no. So I think uh, as a scientist, I believe what they are saying. I see. So let's just turn to the WHO investigation a little bit. Um, as you know, the original uh, investigation by scientists assembled by WHO as well as uh, China's government and the investigation returned inconclusive findings um, and received some criticism from the U.S. government. Uh, I remember Secretary Blinken told CNN that uh, the Biden administration had real concerns about the methodology and the process that went into that WHO report. 
and including the fact that the, the Chinese government seemed to have written part of the report. So based on your conversations with those experts and based on your knowledge of the investigation, uh, do, do you think Secretary Blinken's assessment of the investigation is accurate? No, I don't. I, th I think it's an incorrect assessment. I've read the report, in fact, in great detail. And uh, I have spoken, as you mentioned, to three people who were on the committee. And I don't think it's correct to say that the report was inconclusive. Uh, they concluded that there were four potential ways that uh, the virus may have uh, entered humans. And they assigned a probability to, to each potential route. And you know, the lab leak hypothesis was number four, low down on the list with the lowest probability, the highest probability, which is supported by the results of their studies, is that it originated from an animal in nature. And they suggest additional work that, that should be done to, to sort this out, which what they call phase two. And I have all confidence that this will go forward at some point and, and we'll get an answer to the origin. But I really think it's unfair to characterize this as inconclusive. They did a lot of work. They went through a lot of data and they answered a number of questions. For example, there was no outbreak of, uh, of COVID-19 at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which I mentioned earlier. So I think that the report was well done. Yeah, you know, a frequent criticism I heard about the report is this cold chain theory, which was, you know, mm -hmm. promoted by the Chinese government. And from the WHO report, it seems that that was the probability of cold chain was even higher than lab leak, which was, you know, viewed by outsiders as sort of a compromise, right? So we are mm -hmm. putting uh, the theory promoted by China, China, the Chinese government ahead of the, the lab leak theory. Do you, do you think that's true? So yeah, the the cold chain theory, where maybe uh, the the virus was on the outside of packages of frozen food, uh, that was number three, you know, on the list of probabilities. And I I actually asked the three uh, individuals the other day who were on the committee, and, and they said there was some very uh, weak evidence that the virus could survive on the surface of uh, frozen packages, and that's why it was included in there. But they didn't think it was uh, it was very likely. So I would say they rated about as high as the uh, lab leak hypothesis. I see, I see. So uh, since you've talked with those experts, were they able to get what they needed from from the Chinese? And if not, what was left out? So they got not all of what they wanted to look at. And one of the uh, things they would like to see and which they asked for and, and which they told me they would get would be stored blood from people who had donated blood. And those are kept for about two years in the blood banks in China. And so that would be a very good resource to look at for antibodies to the virus to see how far back you could see the infections arising. So they didn't have that uh, to look at, but they were told that they could get that in the future. So that's that's one thing. Uh, the other is uh, relating to the Huanan seafood market in Wuhan. Uh, as you know, they, they sell a variety of meat and seafood products there, and all of that had been cleared out uh, after the outbreak in an attempt to stop the outbreak. And the committee made it very clear that that was absolutely the right thing to do to stop the outbreak. The consequence, of course, is that we don't have any of the animals to check for the virus, but they did find a uh, virus in the environment at the market, you know, on the floors of the market and so forth. So uh, what they wanted to do next was to take and trace back the source of some of the animals sold at the market into the countryside from the farms where they come from and see if we could find the virus there. And again, they were told that they would be able to do that. And those are two very important pieces of evidence that they need to get. Gotcha, gotcha. And, you know, after that phase one investigation, now the global community is calling for, you know, a transparent science-based follow-up investigation into the origin of the pandemic. So what should be the focus of phase two investigation and how will the phase two be different from phase one? So I think that this WHO investigation is a science-based transparent investigation. I don't know why people are now calling for that because that's what's going on here. And I think maybe some of the scientists who are calling for that don't realize that's what's going on. As I said, phase two uh, involves collection of more data, including the blood bank information that I just talked about, uh, animal samples, but also sampling wildlife 
throughout different parts of China to see if we can identify the specific animal that harbors the virus that's closest to SARS-CoV-2, the ancestor, because we don't have that uh, at the moment. It's also my understanding that uh, they want to sort through additional hospital records. They did a lot of that already, uh, looking for records for indications of COVID. You know, all of the clinical samples so far were negative and there were no signatures of the disease, but they want to expand that investigation as well. And I think that would be important to do. I see, I see. So um, let's talk a little bit about intelligence it's kind of an interesting topic because you never thought intelligence was, was linked to you know, tracking down a, a virus. But in fact, President Biden said on Wednesday he has directed the U.S. intelligence community to redouble their efforts in investigating the origins of COVID-19 and you know, report back to him in 90 days. So in general, what role does intelligence play in tracking down the source of the pandemic? I would say it has zero role. Intelligence is not a science-based effort. It's spying, basically. And they won't tell us where they get the information because that's an important part of spying, right? Um, so we're not going to get any science out of that. And in fact, in 90 days is too too soon to get any scientific results. And that's really what's going to solve this. Um, I, I don't have any faith that what they get from intelligence is going to tell us anything. Because as I said earlier to you, what we need to know is where the virus came from. We have to look in animals. We have to look in blood specimens and so forth. And you don't need any spying in order to do that. You don't need any intelligence gathering. You need to do the science. So I think that is really um, an unnecessary and unneeded effort. We need to do the science, and that needs to be done by scientists and, and clinicians. And that's the way to solve this issue. Right. So, you know, speaking of the, the timeline, right, um, how long does it usually take scientists to track down the source of a virus, speaking from mm. experience? Well, th we have some information on that. So SARS-1, of course, which uh, arose in around 2003, took about 14 years to figure out that it came from a bat in a cave which infected a civet cat which was then brought into a meat market in Guangzhou. 14 years. However, some in some cases we never know. Ebola virus outbreaks in Africa, we never know where they come from. It's very difficult to track that down. Uh, on the other hand, we found out in less than a year that uh, MERS coronavirus outbreaks which happened on the Arabian Peninsula come from camels. And that was fast because basically 100% of the camels there are infected with the virus. And it was very easy to see going to people here. We're talking about a, an isolated few bats. And so I, I would say be patient. This is not going to be resolved in 90 days for sure. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, finally, I wanted to chat with you about some contrarians in the scientist, uh, scientist community. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, Professor David Baltimore a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, a very notable Nobel Prize winner, um, very famous in the community. So I have this quote from Professor David Baltimore. He said, when I first saw the furin cleavage site in the viral sequence with its uh, arginine condens, I said to my wife, it was a smoking gun for the origin of the virus. These features make a powerful challenge to the idea of a natural origin for this virus. So can you please unpack that statement a little bit for mm -hmm. us? and? Mm -hmm. Tell us, do you agree with Professor uh, Baltimore's argument here? So I have to say that I worked with David Baltimore many years ago. He's brilliant, but this statement is unfortunately incorrect. The furin cleavage site is not a smoking gun of any kind. And let me let me under, explain to you what that is. In, in the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, and everyone knows what the spike is, right? Because all the vaccines are, or many of the vaccines are based on spike. There is a, a series of amino acids, which is a site for, for cutting by enzymes called proteases, and they're called furins, uh, to cut the protein. And that, that cutting is needed for high uh, infectivity of the virus. Now, uh, if you look at uh, related, all the most similar viruses, SARS-CoV-2-like viruses that have been isolated from bats, uh, they do not have this furin cleavage site. And so that is what Dr. Baltimore was referring to. He said, well, none of these other viruses in nature have this site, and this one does, so 
to him that suggests that it was made in a lab, right? Because we don't see this in nature. However, it's not correct to say that uh, it's not found in nature. There are other coronaviruses, in fact, MERS coronavirus, and one of the common cold coronaviruses of humans have a furin cleavage site. Uh, there are other coronaviruses, feline coronaviruses have a furin cleavage site. And in fact, some of the bat coronaviruses that are similar to SARS-CoV-2 have something that looks like a, a furin cleavage site. So these furin cleavage sites are circulating, are in bats, uh, are in viruses in nature. And to say that uh, it's, it's completely unusual, it's a smoking gun, is simply wrong. And I'm sorry, but uh, I think Dr. Baltimore simply didn't have the information at his fingertips. I mean, it may have been his initial impression, but uh, it would have been good if he had corrected it. Yeah, we really hope it could, you know, it sort of issues more of a clarification on that. Because mm -hmm. as you know, when a Nobel Prize winner says something, sure. people tend to believe it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, we, we also happen to know that you also interact with public health officials frequently, uh, like people like Dr. Fauci. So after a year of pandemic, we're now finally seeing some light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, hopefully. Um, so looking back, how would you assess the United States public health response during the pandemic? What are some of the lessons we've learned this time? Well, for the first year or so, we had a, um, a very poor public health response. Um, as you know, um, Dr. Fauci was one of the people who was trying to coordinate it, and he was often at odds with the former president of the United States. And, you know, we were very slow to recognize this as a problem, despite the fact that you know, the virus was identified very early. Uh, the first virus is coming into the U.S. in Washington, and uh, the state of Washington, that is. And we, we knew the problems it could cause, yet we didn't do anything. And in fact, we were assured by the president that it would be ending very soon. You know, we weren't told to wear face masks. Diagnostic tests were not developed rapidly enough. Uh, intensive care unit capacity in hospitals was not developed quickly enough. So we were very slow to respond. And as a consequence, the virus spread extensively and many people died. Uh, and that continued. You know, the whole face mask denial continued throughout much of 2020. Now, we were very fortunate that by the end of the year, we had two vaccines uh, that were tested and, and, and approved, uh, given emergency approval uh, in the U.S. But even then, the distribution was left to the states. And only with the administration change did all of this suddenly change. The vaccine distribution was improved. You know, we were doing face masking and so forth. So the, the moral is public health is not a political issue. It always is treated as such, unfortunately. Politicians like to grab infectious diseases and use them to their own advantage. But you have to leave the public health officials alone and let them do their work because they're the ones who know what's going on, not the politicians. And I think this is, so some former CDC head from the US made this statement, this is a textbook way of not to take care of a pandemic, exactly what the US did. And this will be written for years about the, the ways we shouldn't be handling these. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Van Canielo, for all the insights. Thank you so much. It's been a great conversation. And I look forward to talking with you further in the future. Be my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice weekend. You too. Bye.